that's tomorrow at 11. And uh, Thursday, Parsha to Shavua, 8.30, that's going to be me. And then it'll, 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 it'll rotate every week. And then on Sunday, Menachem Liebtag is going to be starting a series. On Monday, um, Joseph Dweck, Rabbi Dweck on Sephardic Halacha. Uh, next Tuesday, we're going to have a special talk on Hebrew manuscripts by, by Yoel Finkelstein of the National Library in Israel. Uh, Wednesday, we're going to start a weekly class on the Haftorah of the week. And Marty Lection will talk, begin his talk on, on Persia Newt, and Thursday, Shuli Mishkin on archaeology. So all this has, uh, you're hearing it for the first time. You should get an email later on, probably later today or tomorrow about all of this, but just to give you advance warning. Uh, not warning, advance encouragement, advance uh, notice. Okay, Dr. Benny, are you back yet? Yes, you are. Okay, let me make you co-host. So we got lots going on, lots to keep everybody busy with lots of learning. Dr. Benny, can you hear us? I'll take that as a no. Now, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Ah, nice to see you. Shalom Aleichem, how are you doing? How is everybody? Baruch Hashem, how are you doing? Baruch Tov, the Bari Lekula. Okay, Tov, Tov, okay, Mitsuyan. Okay, Natriel for Otaka, Otaka hates here, so. Yeah, no, no, no. Any one of these times you should give the class in, in German. You know, the you should give the class in German. Of course, no one would be here, but uh, that's a different story. Or when possible, they could run over time. Oh, this is part of this overall something. strategy to slow uh, this process down as much as possible. This they is have these technical legislative they can use, they can request them to be held over a week. I mean, that's why our confirmation vote oh, before the full floor of the Senate will be delayed. Okay, I think we're ready to start. So if everybody could, could mute themselves, you know, please, otherwise, I'll do it for you. Um, so. Okay, it's uh, it's twelve fifteen, and we do like to start on time. So, uh, Vakasha, part four, Doctor Benny, a pleasure to welcome back. Hope you had a nice time. Hope your season's over. And, uh, Someone is talking who's not supposed to be talking. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, please please mute yourself. Are you sure you are on the right side? Okay, Doctor Benny, you can begin. Thank you very much. So a uh, happy good winter, a healthy winter for everybody. It's a pleasure to start lecture number four on the topic Sefer Tehillim. And this topic, we are talking about chapter 18, Mizmor Yudchet. And I want to see first, in a very systematic approach, what is the structure of this Mizmor. It's one of the longer Mizmorim, 51 Psukim. I want to, to say not too many, too much details on that. I want to talk about the structure and to try to identify the essence by the way that we try to understand the structure of this mismo. I want to talk the, about the parallel in uh, Shmuel bit, where in Shmuel, the second book of Shmuel, the really the same chapter is quoted the same, exactly the same way. Not exactly, there are differences. And that leaves, that opens a lot of questions. Why do we have two texts in the Tanakh with some differences? That happens to me in my computer because I save the files, not properly, but for the Bible, that's not appropriate. And it gives, it gives the feeling that it's arbitrary once it's a little bit like that, a little bit like the other way. And why do we need it twice? What for? So the question is better than most answers. And I think that with a good analysis, we can go and you can we can achieve a very interesting insight by comparing these two books, these two chapters, by the context of Shmuel and Tehillim. We will talk about these differences based initially on the approach by the Abrabanel, an outstanding commentator, and afterwards we should see how this chapter fits in Sefer Tehillim in the narrative of the of the third unit as we discussed in the previous shiul, uh, uh, sorry, of the, of the third unit. Sorry, of the second unit, it's a mistake. So I would like to start it usually with an introductory note. And I choose these introductory notes with a lot of thoughts. And I want to ask here a basic question. 
Who wrote Sefer Tehillim? It says in the 73 of the 150 chapters, it says David. So Chazal say David wrote it. David Katavet Sifro. On the other hand, it says that Sefer Tehillim talks about Shivat Zion, the return of from the exile. 126, Shira Malot, Beshuba Shem Shivat Zion. Another chapter, 137, talks about Al Naharot Bavel, on the river, at the river of Babylon. So David was never in Shivat Zion, David was never in the exile in Babylon. So decide, is it pre-exile or is it post-exilic time? And that is a very basic question because it puts the Sefer, it puts the book in a totally different context. I think we approach these questions in many of our Shiurim analysis, and it's worthwhile to have a better understanding. If we look at the diagram of the entire book, we see the first two books here. That's King David's teaching and his life. Okay, that's David, King David. Afterwards, they talk about the destruction, the, the rebuilding and the return from the exile. Fine, that's another story. That is the return from the exile, the revival by Cheni. And here were the quotations from of uh, Shiva Zion and River of Babylon. That is another time. So decide what, talk, what period of time are we talking? And that is a confusing question. And I think the only answer will be if we understand that there is a confusing effect. The point is what King David did at the beginning, despite the fact that his life ends in chapter 72, at the end of chapter 72, it says, here's the end of all the prayers of David ben Yishai. That is indeed his life, his, bio his biography when he lived there. But afterwards, despite of the destruction, he came back to Eretz Yisrael, not he, his spirit, his mind came back. And the fifth book talks at the revival when they came back, back in the second temple period. And that is the way I understand the book today. So it's true, it is King David at the beginning, but it is his mind which influenced the, the story in the second part of the book. And therefore, actually both is true. It is King David's time, but it is also the afterlife, the life what happened after King David. Interestingly enough, we have two Midrashim. One is well known, and the other one is not that well known, but is actually very interesting. And what I, what I enjoy about these two Midrashim, that they are contradicting. One Midrash says in Masechet Baba Batra, in the Talmud, David, David, he was the author, he wrote Tehillim together with 10 different other wise men, other authors. That is one Midrash, and the classical attitude says, yes, David wrote his book. How should we explain Al Narot Bavel, Babylon, Shivat Zion? David had a, a prophetic mind, Ruach HaKodesh. That is very difficult to understand for me because David is presented as a king. David is presented as a strategic thinker, as a writer, Neim Zemirot Israel, but he is never defined as a Navi, as a prophet who knew what's going to happen 400 years or even more after his death. That's not the nature of his personality. So we have another Midrash. And the Midrash says that, that Ezra HaSofer, Ezra the writer, who was also a priest, he, there it says in the Midrash, in two places in the Midrash, Asara bnei adam amru sefer tehilim, the whole list, very similar to the list in the Talmud. And one of them, at the very end, one of them is David, but also Shlomo said it, including also bnei Korach. And the last one mentioned in the Midrash is Ezra. He also said it. That brings a totally, sheds a totally new light on the understanding of the history of Sefer Tehilim. Yes, it is Ezra who used previous authors and thinkers to write his book Tehilim. But what he wrote, Ezra, 
is influenced by different authors. One of them is King David, of course, 73 chapters. But he wrote it much, much later at the time of the Second Temple. This Midrash is a life-saving Midrash for me. Why? Because it's obvious that Al Narot Bavel and Shiva Zion and the prayer like in, in Tehillim 147, Bone Yerushalayim Hashem Nitre Israel Yechanes, God builds Yerushalayim and all the people from the exile will come back. That's not the life of King David. He had a very interesting and rich, rich life, but he was not in the diaspora. He didn't come back. He didn't rebuild the Mikdash. He didn't build the Mikdash at all. So here we have two Midrashim, and I think it's not Midrash A who is right, it was King David, nor is it the second Midrash who is right, it is Ezra. Because even according to the Midrash that Ezra wrote it much later, he used material and thoughts from David. And King David, if he wrote it, he can't have written it on a realistic level. He have to say it's Ruach HaKodesh prophecy. I think that is exactly the main point of the book. It is, uh, uh, it is attributed, a lot of the Mizmorim are attributed to, to David because it's his mind. He was the person, the king, who built Yerushalayim, who had the vision, who was thinking about the Mikdash and that everybody should come back there. The, the, it should be the city of the Jewish people. He didn't see it in his lifetime. He died here. But whatever happened later was actually his vision. So it is true that it is David even afterwards. But what happened afterwards, obviously, it's true it didn't happen out of the blue. It was connected to David. And I think these Midrashim together, as not a, a thesis and an antithesis, it's the synthesis of these two Midrashim who actually made the point. It is at the second temple uh, period, at second temple time, they were reflecting about King David in the first temple uh, period, and there was a revival. The old, one, the old tradition came back. So what I want to show you today is actually a demonstration of this idea. And I called it Tehillim 18, a masterpiece of biblical poetry. I want to focus in particular on the intertextuality. How many connections does this mismo in Tehillim show? The first connection is the source. The whole mismo is taken from Shmuel Bet. It's, it's a imported Mismo, the only one that we really know David said it in his life in Sefer Shmuel. All the other Mismorim are new, new uh, texts, which are Tehillim. But this Mismo 18 is actually a copy-paste with some changes from Shmuel Bet. I want to have a look there. Since we, I want to demonstrate the intertextuality, I want to show you that King David used the song of Hannah, the mother of Shmuel, and Shmuel, who was involved with this, with the beginning, the establishment of kingdom. It is the mother Hannah who wrote, who, who sang a song, who wrote a beautiful song at the beginning of Shmuel. And King David, at the end of Sefer Shmuel, he was singing his life based on the text of Hannah. That's very interesting. I will show that later. That defines, these two songs define Sefer Shmuel beginning at the, at the end. I will show you furthermore that, Shmu, that King David in his beautiful song, he used very, very clearly texts from Moshe. Moshe was the model, the role model for King David to write his own life story. And he used that, and I would show you the intertextuality, intertextuality. He strongly identifies himself with Moshe. And afterwards, we come to the time of Ezra. Ezra Hasofer, the scribe, who was the priest. The priests were strongly involved at the second, second temple period. They were strongly involved with uh, teaching. So the text in Tehillim Yudchet that we see here is very similar to Shmuel is quoted from Shmuel, but has very fine and very well determined, clear, clear uh, thought, uh, thought through changes, which we should take a look at. And that will be very interesting to compare. And chapter 18 
emphasizes the learning of the Torah, which is part of the unit 18, 20, 19, 20, 21. We'll take a look at it soon. And that is part of the third, of the second unit in Sefer Tehillim. We shall see that this chapter 18 is actually not disconnected. It's not isolated. Chapter 18 is, is like a basis for many, many texts in Sefer Tehillim. And I can give you only a few examples how chapter 18 connects to a lot of other connects to a lot of other texts in Sefer Tehillim and is a, a very basic source for the entire book. So whatever I explained you now might be very dizzy. You get dizzy to see these connections and you don't understand what I'm talking about. That is not bad at the beginning to give you an overview. I hope that at the end of the lecture, you will understand what I'm trying to show. So let's go now and took a, take a look on the structure of Sefer of the 18th chapter. It is built, and that's the big chidush inside. It is built in a, not only a concentric structure, it has a chiastic structure, a chiasm. That's the, the term is built on the Greek uh, uh, word, uh, letter chi, which you see here. It's like A, B, and B connects afterwards B, A. So if you have a text, here's the classic example. In next week's parasha, in 10 days, it says, Shofech dam ha'adam, ba'adam damo yishafech. The English translation, which you see here, was capable to catch this structure. Whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. That's a punishment of midah keneget midah. What is the idea of ABC, CBA? Whatever he did wrong and violated society or values, the same way he will be punished, CBA. That's the idea of a, of a, of a chiasm. Interesting that the Mishnah was familiar with the term chi. It says in the Mishnah, kol ha-menachot keitzat moshchan kemin chi. That was a special service in the temple, which will not go in further detail, but Chazal were aware of this structure. Here we have the entire, let's now take a look at Mizmor Yudchet, the source in Shmuel. And we see here, it is too small to read it, but we see here a structure of terms at the beginning, A, B, C, D, E, and there is an axis in the middle. And afterwards, it is E, D, C, B, A. That is a clear structure. We didn't read the text. It will be too much for this lecture to read the text. I want now to read the five psukim in the middle. It says, you, you have the translation here, and you see in colors, yellow is the frame, blue, and in the middle is Pasuk 23. What is King David saying? He says, I kept his Torah. God, he says before, help me. And I try to follow your way. Help me to fulfill that because I'm, I'm committed to your Torah, 23. And indeed, he says about himself, Va'ehi, I was blameless with him. I kept myself from Chatai me'avonot. And therefore, indeed, you did it. The, the structure, the formality of the mismo of this song says, there is a turning point in the middle. I'm committed to the Torah. Whatever happened before, I was in big trouble. Whatever happened before that, has, that I asked Hashem for help, and he indeed came down and helped me and took me out of all of my trouble, is because I was praying to him, help me. i trying to be uh, blameless with you. Help me to, to accomplish what I want because I, I, I'm supporting your Torah. In the, in the second part, it says, yes, 
indeed Hashem did it and helped me and saved me and supported me and even appointed me to be the, the father of the kingdom, the founder of the dynasty of Malchut Beit David. That is the structure of Sefer Tehilim in a nutshell. So if we understand this structure, not only as a literary unit, we understand it. How did David consider his life? How does the old King David think his uh, view, his own life, his development? The old man at the end of Sefer Shmuel, he reviews his life. I was in big trouble. First part of the Mizmor. I prayed Hashem. I trusted to Hashem. And it came to the point. I asked him for help, for help because I tried to be uh, I tried to follow his way, to keep his ways, and I kept his Torah. Therefore, the turning point is my entire life was that I was trying to accomplish the Torah. I was thriving to do that, and in indeed Hashem uh, gave me this merit and supported me because I supported the Torah, and I'm now, the king, I'm now King David, the founder of the dynasty. That's the way he sees his life. And I'm the founder of the dynasty. At the end, it says, Migdol Yeshuot Malko Chesed Lim Shicho, Hashem, you help your uh, Mashiach, LeDavid Ulezao Ad Olam. And if we look at the other words, which I cannot show you in much detail here, but I'm trying to make it a little bit bigger, at the, at the beginning, he said, that is the song of King David. Oh, at the very beginning, in verse 1. And at the end, he says, that is the first part of the chiasm. Le David, I'm singing your song. And at the end, he says, Hashem, support David for future generations. You are my, I trust you, I believe, I, I trust Hashem in, in part B. That's what he says at the end. Hashem, you came down and tachat raglecha, under your feet, you helped me and came down to me. And the King David says afterwards, and I'm fighting against my, my enemies and they are tachat raglai. So King David is comparing himself as a mirror. And that fits very, very well. The idea, the structure of this mismo, sorry, the structure of this mismo, and it follows also very, very nicely the idea how King David saw himself. God's kingdom on earth comes down through David, first part, second part, and the turning point in the middle is because King David was committed to his Torah. That is the structure of David of Mizmo Yutchet and the analogy, the source in Shmuel. Atkan Akafarishona. So far, the first point we looked at. The chapter. Now I want to see how is that connected to Shirat Chana. With Teisha Stein Teisha 929, there is a special opportunity, not necessarily to understand to understand every chapter in, in a deep way and all the commentaries, but to see the overview, the surface, the flow. And there is a lot of insights. How do we understand the connection? Here we have a beautiful example that the beginning of Sefer Shmuel talks about the song of Chana. The end of the second book of Sefer Shmuel talks about how does King David see his entire life. I don't think it should be the goal of a class in English where reading the text and the translations and small observations in the text, it will take a lot of time and we will miss the point. What I'm trying to show you here I took uh, these psukim from David's song at the end of Sefer Shmuel, and I compared it to the Shira, the song of Chana, her song. And you see a lot of very specific terms are repeated here and there. And he, we have even other very specific terms like Bashamayim Yarem. Whatever it means, I'm not going to the details. What, what is on white on black color is comes together only in these two psukim. Chana, the mother of Shmuel, she prayed at the end of her of her prayer. She said, "Hashem will give power to his king, and Haramat Kerem triumph to his anointed one, the Mashiach." That was the last line of Shirat Chana. 
Chana had no children. She got a present from Hashem. She got a boy, Shmuel. He was not connected, not connected to kingdom. It was at the time before the kingdom was established. Actually, the person who will be in charge to establish the kingdom is Shmuel. So how come does that fit here? But here is a wonderful beauty of intertextual reading of the entire book of Shmuel. Chana, the mother of, of uh, Shmuel, she was praying for the child because she had no children. And here we see a beautiful entity. There was a mother who had a big dream. She had vision. She, had, she saw the future and she, she got the mother, she got the child, Shmuel. So it was her dream that the Malchut, the kingdom, should come through. That was her song of her personal life. Interestingly enough, that when King David, at the end of the book of Shmuel, and he knew Shmuel because Shmuel appointed him to be the king, the follower after Shmuel, uh, after Shaul. If he sang his life, David, he integrated texts from Chana saying, I'm inspired by Chana because she is the mother of this idea. A long time before there was a king in Am Yisrael, she had the dream, I want to have a boy, I believe in the future, I believe in the future of the next generations. And she was talking about kingdom and Mashiach. It's the same word, Melech and Mashiach, at the end of the Song of Chana, which appears the same words again at the end of the Song of David. David is saying, I have a vision for the future. My vision actually goes back, as I summarized here, that, that her prayer was before the start of the monarchy of Am Yisrael. But that is the basis for the song of the life of David. That was he was thonging. And of course, that's the idea afterwards when we come to Tehillim. So far, the context, that is the construction, the frame of the entire book of Shmuel, the two books of Shmuel. David, King David had the awareness. My life story is not only a summary of my life, Personally, it's a summary of the period of kingdom. Kingdom in the past goes back not to Shaul, the first king, and not to Shmuel, who was the person who established it. It goes back to the mother of Shmuel, because the mother who has a dream to give birth to a child, she is really the mother of this idea. Atkan Akafashnia. Now we come and look at a third connection. And that is the, the, the miracle, the beauty of intertextuality. If King David in his song uses other ideas and motifs and language, it was a deep understanding why he did so. So let's take a look now. Where else did David take texts for his song, for his Shirat Chaim, the song of his life? And here we see the first line, it says in uh, Tehillim 18, That is the song of David, the servant of Hashem, who spoke this song uh, the day when he was saved. That is exactly the term which appears only twice in the Bible. At divrei hashira hazot, is the text in the fifth book of the Torah. It appears only twice in the entire Bible at Divrei Hashira Hazot. When, when Moshe Rabbeinu finished his mission at the end of the Torah, he says that's the Divrei Hashira Hazot. He calls the entire Torah a song, a poetry, and it's, it appears there twice. And he was teaching this entire song to Am Yisrael and to Yehoshua. So if King David sings the song of his life as a summary, he actually summarizes the same way Moshe did it at the end of his life, he does it now. He, uh, Moshe was called Evet Hashem, as we read a few days ago, and that's the term that David, uh, that is applied for, uh, attributed to David. In the Shira, in the song of uh, David, it says, he prays, Hashem yishlach mi marom yikacheni, yamsheni mi maim rabim. 
God, help me from there and take me out. Take me out of the, vo of the water. Yamsheni is the word which appears only in the context of Moshe Rabbeini, of Moshe Rabbeinu. It says that the daughter of Paro saw him in the river, and she called him Moshe, ki min so if King David asks for help from heaven, he actually says the same way you helped Moshe Rabbeinu in Egypt, the same way, please help me. Furthermore, he says, Erdof I will pursue my foes and will overtake them. That's exactly what we say in Shirat Hayam. And very meaningfully, in Shirat Hayam, in Exodus 15, these are the enemies of Am Israel who say that they wanted to kill the Jewish people. But King David, he makes sure, he wants to make sure that he will take care of the security of Am Israel as, um, uh, and Yerushalayim as the city. He is the, uh, the, the, the commander in the army. So the word, they were, the same word that they were uh, victims from Egypt, he says, now, no, I will not be a victim anymore. I will make sure that our enemies will not attack me. If so, King David had not only a strong connection to Hana, he had a very, very strong connection to Moshe Rabbeinu. Indeed, his book, Tehillim, has five books, the same way as the entire Torah has five books. The entire Torah ends with Ashrecha Yisrael, at the end of Dvarim, the last word, the last sentence from David, from Moshe Rabbeinu is Ashrecha Yisrael. And the first word of, Moshe, of, the, of King David is Ashrei Ha'ish, talking about the Torah. So the analogy and the, uh, the analogy between David to Moshe is very, very strong in the Midrash. But what you see here on the slide, three very specific uh, terms, which are strongly related to Moshe Rabbeinu. At kan akafa shlishit. We come now to the main comparison, which is chapter 18 in Tehillim, and the chapter at the end of Shmuel Bet, which are, uh, are two versions of the same Mizmor. And you see them here in red and in blue. It's too small to read it, and I don't intend to read it. I have it, of course, at home, and that's the way I read and research it. And here comes a very strange feeling. If we have two texts and they are similar, they shouldn't be repeated altogether. I don't need one text one twice. Text. I can just read it. For, I can just read it for a second time, and I'm fine. Why do I read two texts? So there is a reason for that, and that's actually a very, I think, a very strong feeling of frustration if we read the Torah and don't understand it well, why is it repeated? And the entire book of Tehillim, you get the impression, we get the impression that you don't understand the details. If you could mute, please, or not talk at the same time, that would be helpful. So in the entire book of Tehillim, we have very, very often a mismo. The writer, the psalmist, is in problem. He asks for help, and he describes his pain. And afterwards, he prays to Hashem, and Hashem is good enough with him, and he helps him. At the end, he thanks him. So that is a basic template which comes back very, very often. If you read the book on a very superficial level, yes, you can say it's always the same, and the entire book of Tehillim is very repetitive. But that's not the way to read the book of Tehillim. We have to pay attention to the differences. If the text is repeated for a second time, there is a reason for it. And if it is repeated, it wants to tell us a message and a story. And if there are changes, minor changes, there is a deep, deep message to it. So here we have two different approaches, how to understand that. And I think it's actually an excellent lesson, how to learn reading the Torah. There was uh, the, the biblical criticism says, oh, it is of course, it is uh, tradition repeated, uh, different sources and one person couldn't read very well, the other guy didn't, he wasn't able to write very well and the third one, had uh, had problems to write it, 
or to listen to that. So it's a, a tradition with mistakes. That's what it is. And it's just a, a, a accumulation of many mistakes. One didn't hear, one didn't write it proper, and the other one didn't understand it. And different tradition, meaningless. That is, for me, an unacceptable approach. And it looks at the Torah on a very unrespective level. We don't really take it serious. For me, the big master to understand these two Mizmorim is the famous Abrabanel, a commentator from Spain. Oh, you would say he didn't write a commentary on Sefer uh, Tehilim. That's true. But he wrote a beautiful commentary on the Torah and on the Vim, including Shmuel. If you're interested to learn more about him, it is the father of Bibi Netanyahu, who did a lot of research and wrote one of the fascinating books on Don Yitzchak Abrabanel. And he says only one chapter from the Abrabanel, only one chapter of Sefer Tehilim is interpreted by Abrabanel. It's chapter 18. Of course, it's not chapter 18 in Tehilim, it is chapter 22 in Sefer Shmuel. And he has there more than 10 pages to explain the difference. He was the Minister of Economy of Finances in Spain for Ferdinand and Isabella at the time of the expulsion. So he knew it mathematics. He was a very, very systematic man. And what he wrote here is the following. Thank you, Audrey, for the translation. And when I think about this, why it's repeated, the book of Psalms was composed by King David himself at the end of his life to teach the meditator uh, to arrange before, and, and to arrange before him the prayers that he wants to say and pray for, uh, for in times of distress and compiled the Psalms, which he said in the early day of his trouble, so that the meditator could use them when praying for his own similar sorrows and calamities when, uh, which had come upon David. So he says the following idea. King David, at the end of his life, he said, I'm reviewing my life. Hashem blessed me. Hashem saved me. I kept his Torah. I had a good life. Says Avabanel, King David, at the end of his year of his life, he took the time and said, what I prayed, I want to prepare it as a prayer book for other Jews. They should use my experience and experience and use the text for their own life. A beautiful term, lehanhagat hamit bodet. Mit bodet is a person who is on his own, who is thinking, reflecting, and meditating on his life. Abba Banel has a beautiful insight. King David used it, but in order to make it relevant for somebody else, you have to make some changes. And these changes, which are needed from my own experience for somebody else, they need an adjustment. And he made 74 changes. Abramanel is extremely systematic. You need a lot of energy to read it through. To the best of my knowledge, his commentary is not translated. So let me give you now a few ideas. And I will not explain you all the 74, but I want to tell you trends and rules. A different emphasis of Shmuel is that he gave a thanksgiving in the song of his life for what Hashem did to him. But in the book of Tehilim, he prepares a prayer book for help in David's prayer book. So these are prayers for others. So please take a look. And these are not mistakes. If, uh, if David said, and God heard my voice from his place, in Tehilim, the Vav is gone. Where you see my arrow, it says instead of Vaishma, Yishma Mehechalo. Hashem helped me in my darkness, said King David in Shmuel, Vayashet Choshech Svivo. And in, in Tehilim, he prays, God, please help me. It says in, uh, in uh, Shmuel, and I killed my enemies, and I, I, uh, I had victory, and they cannot uh, fight me anymore. And they fell in front of me. David uses in Sefer Tehilim the same term, the same pasuk, with minor changes as a prayer. V'achalem, he doesn't quote. V'lo uh, uh, they will never get up against me. He prays they should never get up 
against me. They fell under me? No, they should fall under me. That's the prayer. And the famous difference is what we know from Bilkat Amazon. David prayed, Hashem, you are my tower. Migdol Yeshuot. But in the prayer book of Tehilim, he says, no, Magdil Yeshuot. I hope Hashem will increase his help for me. By these tiny, little, beautiful changes, he changes the thanksgiving prayer of the Song of King David to the prayer of anybody who will learn from him. That's a beautiful insight of, of Abravanel to show the difference. Let me show you another difference. And it's quite a challenge to give a good, a good uh, example from that. At the beginning of Sefer Tehilim are three words. Er chamcha Adonai chizki, which is translated, I love you, or I pray Hashem for your mercy, for your rachamim. That is totally missing in Shmuel. Why? Says Abrabanel, because in Sefer Shmuel, he is thanking for his own life in Tehillim. He, he uses that that others should pray in order to be uh, uh, saved the way David was saved. Now here comes something very interesting. This edition in Sefer Tehillim has something else that is very remarkable. Er Chamcha, Rashi explain it is I love you or you love me. And that is the term which in the Bible Ve'ahavta l'reach ha'kamocha is translated by the Targum Ve'terachem, you should love. What is Rashi saying? In order to understand the term Er Chamcha, you have to understand Aramaic. David spoke Aramaic? For sure not. But those who came back at the temple, at the second temple from the exile, they spoke Aramaic. So here we have something very interesting. In Shmuel, it says, And in, in Tehillim, it says, The word Gevar, Whatever the context is, is typically Aramaic. It appears in the Bible only in Sefer Daniel, which is written in Aramaic. And we know it in, uh, from the uh, Aramaic uh, texts in Yaribon, Elu Yechei Gevar Shinin Alfin. Gevar is the Aramaic term for Gibor. Why is Sefer Tehillim changing Gibor, a hero, to Gevar, a man? And that is something which I want to explain differently than the Abrabanel. Oh, sorry. Which I want to understand in a different way than the Abrabanel. Abrabanel says it was written by David. In parallel to his life, says Don Yitzchak Abrabanel, David wrote himself the book of Psalms as a prayer, as a prayer book to guide the meditator how to pray. I do think, and uh, Abra Banel is the big master, but allow me to tell the way I think it should be understood. If Psalm 18 has typical features which are Aramaic, and it is written even in Aramaic words, so it was written at the time of the Second Temple period when they came back from Babylon, where they spoke Aramaic. When they came back, that's exactly what I said in the introduction, that it was written by Ezra and Nehemiah when they came back. There are more examples, which I will not elaborate now, based on the Abrabanel, where we have typical contextual changes in Tehillim 18, which were added based on the context. If you want to review it here, you will see it all. So by that, we understood the following. It was Ezra who took the material from the first temple period, and said, that is wonderful. We come back from the exile. We come back to Eretz Israel. We come back to Jerusalem, the city of King David. The founder of David of Jerusalem is David Melech. David Melech Israel Chai Kayam. Let's take his material. And we take his material and we pray the way David prayed. And we add to his time, we add something very special. What is important in David's life? It's important in David's life, sorry, that everything was about the Torah. Chapter 18 talks about the Torah. 
Chapter 20 and 21 talks about the future of the kingdom. If chapter 18 is the past kingdom of King David as the founder of the dynasty, chapter 20 and 21 is a prayer for future kings. That is the structure of the, um, the three, the four chapters in the middle of unit two. And we learned in the previous lecture had the structure about chapter 15 and 24. What are the general features of human qualities and what is, uh, uh, what is needed to come to the level of King David? So here it's summarized in English. At the entering to the temple, chapter 15, what are the basic moral qualities? At the end, what are the qualities that bring us closer to Hashem? Melech HaKavod. So that is the unit, that is the thought, the narrative of the second unit. Chapter 15 says, how do I get closer to this goal at the spite of my, of my lamentation, of my, of my needs? What is the best way? Learn from King David, chapter 18. Learn the essence of his life, which is he was committed to the Torah. Oh, you're committed to the Torah. We will bring the next kingdom following King David's life in the history in the past, we bring it to us in the future. And by doing so, we will feel comfortable to with Hashem and we will come closer to Hashem, chapter 24, very similar to chapter 15. That is the narrative of the second unit. I think that is a must, an absolute masterpiece of biblical literature. So what Ezra HaSofer did, he took material from King David and he tried to find what is the relevance, what is the, the value, the, act, the actual value for our lifetime, what we learned from King David. Very beautiful. He comes to the city of David. Let's listen to him. Every child knows David Melech Israel Chai Kayam. What does it mean Chai Kayam? He died. He was buried in Yerushalayim. We know what time and afterwards were other kings. His life of David remains relevant. Why? Because in his chapter, Shmuel, the original authentic chapter of his, life, of his life, the song of his life, he said, Le David u le zaro ad olam. You give the kingdom to me and you will be chesed. You will do chesed for me and all the children for future generations. Therefore, Ezra used him as a template for future generations. In Sefer Tehilim, and Abrabanel explained the difference. I want to explain, he didn't only write the Sefer Tehilim in his time as a prayer book, it was Ezra Sofer who, 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 who wrote the Sefer Tehilim. Yes, based on David, because David katav et sifro, but he applied it for his generation. It is true, it is both David who wrote it and both Ezra. Both Midrashim are 100% right. And Ezra embedded it, connected it as part of a narrative. Past kingdom in 18 is the future kingdom in 2021. What is the turning point? We spoke about the chiasm. What's the meaning of a chiasm? That there is a turning point. What happened in the past can be uh, applied for the future. How? If we take the Torah in the middle, that's exactly the meaning. Now I want to show you that in chapter 18, it says, Le'evet Hashem. In Shmuel, King David didn't call himself Evet Hashem. Why did he say Evet Hashem? We will see in a moment. Because in chapter 19, the psalmist prays, Gam avdecha nizhar bahem. I want to be your Evet. The same way King David is called the Evet, in his own chapter, I want to be at Evet in chapter 19. So there are many, many, many details to prove this idea. We saw when we spoke about here the structure of the second unit, where the center is 18, 19, 20, 21. It is implanted in the narrative of 15 and 24. We need good qualities, as we discussed in the last week's Shiul, Good qualities tease to enter the Mikdash. Good basic moral qualities of humanity. Good values. 
In chapter 24, no, it is the Mikdash. It is the appearance of Hashem who brought us closer to that King David who was committed to the Mikdash and to the Torah. So you can read these 12 chap these uh, 10 chapters in a wonderful, beautiful flow, in a narrative, in a story, in a religious story. How with King David, I actually, by learning his life, I learned the values of his life, not only as a historical past experience, as a future experience, and that will bring me closer to Hashem in chapter 23. Hashem uh, Hashem. I will sit shifti Hashem. He will be in the God, in the house of God. That's exactly what happened in chapter 24. So it flows and grows closer from 20, from 15, as we saw next, last week in the shiul, which summarizes the slideshow as the, the shiul from last time. I showed here some of the flows. Le'evet Hashem le'David, gam avdecha nizhar bahem, gam mizedim chasoch avdecha. And a lot, a lot, a lot of details. King David said at the end, magdil yeshuot malko ve'ose chesed limshicho, le'david u'lezaro ad olam. And in, 20 chap in chapter 20, we pray, Hoshia Adonai Meshicho. It's exactly the same word what David said in the past, we say for a future king. So the whole unit of 15 to 24 has a beautiful flow. That is a slide which I cannot explain because as I explained previously, you will fire me with if I bring so many details. But that cannot, I, I can also not not, I can also not withhold it from you because I believe these are the details which actually prove that it is strongly connected. Again, white on a colorful background is, it appears only here. And there are a lot of terms. You see here the flow of idea, the topics, which are from the past to the future based on the basic concept of the Torah. That's the way Ezra was teaching Torah. He was the teacher of the Torah, Sofer, Sofer, Ezra Sofer. Of course, the Torah was in the middle of his teaching. And here you have a lot of beautiful terms which are repeated along this unit. If you read now these 10 chapters, you will see how the same term is repeated and is connecting these mizmorim, uh, shaping the connect. The, the, the connection, the contextuality in the text, but not only the contextuality, there is a new idea. We talk here about King David in 18, but afterwards we talk about the, the Messiahs, Hoshia Hashem, Hoshia, Hashem Hoshia, Hamelech Ya'aneinu, Hamelech is Kudush Bochu. And afterwards we talk about Hashem, and at the end about Melech HaKavod. King David brings the kingdom of Hashem on uh, back to the earth. So what I want to summarize here, an additional feature, and that's the last round. How did King David's song, chapter 18, from Shmuel, what is the influence of the entire book of Tehillim? And again, I bring only four examples. In chapter 18, it says, Lam Hashem David. About his enemies, he says, Velo yuchlukum. In chapter 36, he prays the same. The same words exactly, white on a color background. Description of how Hashem helped him in the war is a description how Hashem appears in nature in chapter 104. In Hallel, we say, I was surrounded by dead, by uh, um, life-threatening con conditions, I saw death. That's exactly what King David said in his song. And he wants to go tamim darko because Hashem is tamim darko and he wants to be tamim darki. It appears in chapter 101 and 119. So the poor commentators, the wonderful scholars, the Germany 19th century, they said the words of these later chapters have a very poor vocabulary. They just used old material. Totally wrong. What they took in the chapters later, they were inspired by King David in chapter 18. 
And chapter 18 is a prayer, which is based on King David's song of his life in Shmuel. So you see that chapter 18 has a long career. It keeps living many, many years after his life. The most beautiful example is chapter 120, 144. And we cannot cover the entire book of Tehillim in this shiur. We have to close soon. But what I want to show you here is something wonderful. Chapter 144, without going in any details, has a lot, a lot of terms which are quoting uh, uh, Tehillim 18. Why? In chapter 144, uh, the psalmist says, we want to bring the kingdom of Hashem to all nations. And we'll talk about this chapter when we get there. That is the universal expansion of the idea of King David. King David spoke about the kingdom of Amisal, but chapter 124 talks about his kingdom, which has an impact later on on the entire world. So what I try to show you in this shiu, I hope you are not too dizzy by all these uh, texts. I hope you understood the flow of the ideas, which I, uh, I try to show you here. It started in Shmuel. That is the first temple period. The begin David took from Hana, because he knew history, he went back to all the sources. Hana, the mother who prayed for her son. And he took sources and ideas for Moshe. That's his life. He prayed for the future. Ezra took his text with some changes and wrote chapter 18 in Tehillim. And that was embedded, adjusted to a whole flow of ideas to a system of prayers between 15 and 24. And that had a lot of influence on the rest of the entire book. I don't think that there, is, there are a lot of examples where you can show David Melech Israel Chai Vekayam. I put Chai in special signs, which is actually the numeric value of Yudchet chapter 18. Chapter 18 shows that David has all sources and a huge future. That is the message of intertextuality. What I write for my life is what Hannah was praying for, what Moshe was teaching us. And somebody else can take that for future generation as he wished to do and take it to write the Sefer Tehilim in the same idea as Abrabanel wrote, but I modified his approach. So what we show today, we come to a closing of the second unit. We saw in the last week, chapter 15 and 24, we looked at chapter eight and 19 as well in the middle. And we look today at chapter 18 in the middle, source in Shmuel. And we showed David Melech Israel Chai Vekayam. Next week, we should talk about the third unit. It will be very easy with the experience we had so far. It will be almost self-explanatory. You will, it's the most beautiful structure. And I recommend if you have time to read chapter 24, 25 and 34. So we have the frame and we'll talk about that next time. So that is the way we make progress on our syllabus. We finish the second cycle and we will start the third one in Mirz Hashem next week. Here we have the summary slide on, uh, of this shiul. And I know there was a lot of material but I, sh I hope I could show you the concept and the overview. And we learned actually a lot. Who wrote the uh, Sefer Tehillim? How was the Sefer Tehillim? How did it erase? How did it arise from, a, from another text? And how did Ezra Sofer apply it for his time? If there, is, if there are any questions, I'm happy to try to answer those questions, please. Dr. Benny, take, you can take a look at, at the chat box. There are a few questions if you want to address them. And you can see from the comments that uh, what a lot of people are discovering, what we know from, from 20 years ago, the, the creativity of Dr. Benny. Uh, he used to give shiurim like this in Toronto with the PowerPoint. Now he's just raised it to uh, a new level, but uh, you know, introducing to many of the people. So it's wonderful. They're really uh, always a, a creative thinker and an original thinker and uh, uh, thank you, Yashar Koch. Uh, four down, 26 more to go on this year. But okay, okay, Benny, take a look at the um, 
comments. Uh, someone wants to know why there are, nine, there are only nine people are listed in st instead of 10. Well, can you quote? I didn't have time. I was okay, so I'll, I'll read the questions for you. Number one is there were only nine people quoted. When the, the measure says there are 10, but they only give, give nine names. Okay, I found interesting explanations on that, on that, but let me tell you, uh, I don't have a clear view which one are included, Etam, Avraham. I think the fact that many, many other sources are included there, uh, I cannot, I know Korach, I know Asaf, I know, I know other names. I, can, uh, I, I cannot uh, uh, spell it out. Moshe is quoted. Avraham is considered Etam, so I don't know the difference. I have to check that. And the other main question there is, there's, isn't Mashiach here referring to Appoint, anointing a king as opposed to Melech HaMashiach. Say it again. Is the, her, 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 the Mashiach referring not to the Mashiach in, as in mes, the Messiah, but as in anointing the king with, you know, the Shem and HaMishcha. Correct. correct, correct. So that is actually who did that? Who was the person? Shem Mashach et HaMelech, who brought the oil? That was Shmuel. So no surprise. If David is praying for the Mashiach, where did I get the oil from? We shouldn't talk about Messiahs as a eschatological expression. He, he, was, he touched the oil. Who gave him the oil? It was Shmuel. And who brought Shmuel to the Beit HaMikdash, to, to Shiloh? That was Hana. So, of course, Mashiach in this context is not the future messianic view. It is just the son of of uh, the son of Hana. Okay, and the last question, I guess you sort of related to what the relationship between Ezra and, and David, was Ezra the final editor? How much did he add? What was his, uh, again, it's hard to know, of course. I think it's impossible to know. So it's impossible to know, but let me tell you, it's like a therapeutic midrash. Because if I read the biblical uh, the scientific uh, books and research and the literature, everything is post-exile. Not everything. A lot is post-exile. So how can I, as a believe, as a uh, connected to the Gemara and Chazal, how can I say it's not King David? The other midrash says it. Interesting enough, there is a midrash which says that Ezra was the student of Baruch ben Neria, and Baruch ben Neria. He was the student of Yirmiyahu. So the end of the first temple period is Yirmiyahu and Baruch ben Neria. Baruch ben Neria, who was talking about the exile, but promised they will come back. It's the very same Baruch ben Neria from the school of Yirmiyahu, who said you will be punished in the entire book, but you will also come back, Yirmiyahu. Ezra fulfilled what Yirmiyahu was talking about in a prophecy, and what Ezra learned that from, not from Yirmiyahu, he was too old, he died in Eretz Yisrael. Ezra learned that, according to Chazal, from the student of Yirmiyahu. That connects the line of the first temple period to the second temple.